Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rafi. Thanks for that kind introduction. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, this evening, uh, we're celebrating the life and work of Sergei Yesenin, uh, who lived uh, from 1895 uh, to 1925. Um, we're also holding this event in commemoration of Dr. David Matthews and his wife, Dr. Ludmilla Matthews. Um, David and Ludmilla were both great admirers of the verse of Sergei Yasenin, uh, but they are sadly uh, no longer with us. Uh, Ludmilla died on the 3rd of January uh, 2020, and David on the 5th of March this year. Uh, David and Ludmilla translated many of Yasenin's poems, and a selection of their translations uh, will be read this evening along with the verse in the original. Uh, Lyudmila wrote an article in the Ukrainian press about the circumstances of Yesenin's death. Uh, she also delivered a talk uh, for the Great Britain Russia Society on this subject in 2006. And Lyudmila and David jointly delivered a talk on Yesenin uh, to the Pushkin Club in 2015. Uh, by holding this evening in memory of David and Edmilla, we are paying tribute uh, to them both. In his Holy Yesenin, an anthology of translations with commentary, the brilliant um, Australian translator, Roger Pulvers, argues that in his homeland, Sergei Yesenin is the most popular modern Russian poet. Not everyone would agree with that, uh, but there is no doubt that Yesenin occupies a special place in the affection of all Russians. This is all the more noteworthy, given that for three decades after Yesenin's death, his works were actually banned by, social, uh, by Soviet cultural com uh, commissars. And Yesenin can lay claim to the title of the best loved Russian poet in Russia. His outstanding lyric poetry not only reflects the dramatic personal path he followed, which ended uh, tragically either in suicide or in murder when he was only 30, but also gives voice most poignantly to the Russian soul. In his short life of just 30 years, Yesenin managed to leave a wonderful poetic legacy in both quality and volume, which will live through the centuries. He was born on the 3rd of October, 1895, into a peasant family in the village of Konstantinova in Ryazan province. Uh, Ryazan is about uh, 200 kilometers uh, to the southeast of Moscow. Uh, this is uh, a reconstruction of the house uh, where Yesenin was born. Uh, that's another view of the same house. And this uh, beautiful interior is a room in that house. His parents were of peasant stock, uh, but were not farmers. And both earned their living by seeking employment in different places. Sergei's father, Alexander Nikitich, often worked in Moscow as an assistant in a butcher's shop. His mother, Tatiana Fyodorovna sought employment in Ryazan. Uh, this next picture uh, shows uh, Yesenin's parents with his younger sister, Alexandra. Uh, from the age of three, Sergei was mainly cared for by his maternal grandparents. Uh, he rarely saw his parents who lived apart. His grandparents were old believers and as such, live their lives according to strict religious and moral principles. Sergei grew up in an atmosphere of devout orthodoxy. His grandfather was an expert on church literature. His grandmother had the same sort of influence on him that Arina Radionovna had on Pushkin. She knew many songs, fairy tales and ditties and according to the poet himself, 
It was she who gave him the impulse to write his first poems. Uh, this slide shows uh, Yesen with his two uh, sisters. Um, Yekaterina, the elder of the two sisters, is on the left and Alexandra on the right. Uh, that shows uh, Sergei as a teenager. Um, he attended the Zemstva uh, primary school in Konstantinova. Then from 1909 to 1912, the church teaches secondary school in the nearby large village of Spas Klepiki. In May 1912, he left it uh, with a primary school teacher's diploma. Uh, this uh, slide shows Sergei in about 1912 in a birch copse. Uh, for some time in his youth, by his own admission, he composed only spiritual poetry. It was only at the request of his schoolmates that he decided to try his hand at poetry of a different kind. In August uh, 1912, Yesenin moved to Moscow, where he first got a job in the butcher shop where his father was employed, and then in the Sutin uh, printing house as a proofreader. Here he became close uh, to the Surikov literary and musical circle and was soon elected to the circle's editorial committee. In the autumn of 1913, the poet entered into a civil marriage with Anna Izryadnova, who worked with him as a proofreader in the Sutin uh, printing house. In December 1914, their son Yuri was born. However, in 1915, Yesenin left his family. Um, Anna Izryadnova understood that their relationship had no future. She didn't try to force Yesenin to stay with her and devoted herself to raising their son. In 1916, she helped the poet with the printing of his first book. Uh, Yesenin often visited her and helped her financially. He visited Anna and their son Yuri uh, for the last time, a short time before his death. Uh, tragically, Yuri was arrested following a false denunciation and was shot by the NKVD in 1937. Uh, soon after leaving Anna, uh, Yesenin quit his job and according to Anna, now surrendered himself wholly to poetry, writing all day long. Um, his first publication was the poem, The Birch Tree, Bariosa, uh, which appeared in January, 1914, in the children's magazine, Mirok, Little World. This poem is still part of the Russian school curriculum. Soon, many of his poems were published in the Moscow newspapers, and children's magazines. Uh, between 1913 and 1914, the poet attended lectures at the National Shanyavsky University in Moscow. There, for the first time, he discovered, among others, the works of Belinsky, Nekrasov, and Gogol. However, Yesenin was dying to go to St. Petersburg. In his opinion, all the main events of literary life uh, took place there. He ended one of his letters uh, to his friend Grigory Panfilov with the words, Moscow is not the mover of literary development. It simply tries to prepare people to be ready for St. Petersburg. So in 1915, Yesenin moved, moved to what was now Petrograd. Immediately upon uh, arrival, he visited the great symbolist poet, um, Alexander Bloch. A note has survived recording Bloch's comment on his verse. His poems are fresh, pure, and sonorous. Yesenin obtained from Bloch letters of recommendation uh, to the editors of two literary magazines. Uh, Yesenin also made a favorable impression on other famous metropolitan poets, including Zinaida Gipios and Sergei Gorodetsky. He quickly established himself as a highly regarded poet in Petrograd literary circles. 
Indeed, his ascent to fame in 1915 was meteoric and his poems appeared in many metropolitan journals and magazines. In, all, in October 1915, uh, Yersenin met the most significant peasant poet at that time, Nikolai Okluyev. Their meeting was the beginning of a very fruitful cooperation between the two poets, which included joint readings of their poetry. In the autumn of 1915, Yersenin became a member of the literary group, uh, group Krasa and of the literary and artistic uh, society Strada. Strada became the first symbolic expression of the identity of the group of uh, so-called new peasant poets. In 1916, uh, Yesenin was drafted into the Russian Imperial Army, but thanks to the efforts of his friends, he was appointed as an orderly in the Tsarskoye Silo Military Hospital Train Number 143, whose patron uh, was none other than Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna. That's the Tsarina uh, with her son, Alexei. Uh, this appointment allowed Yesenin uh, to freely visit literary salons and to lead a full artistic life. At one of the concerts in the infirmary to which he was assigned, he met the royal family. Uh, the Empress and her daughters uh, worked as nurses in the infirmary. And here you will see the Empress um, in this picture, uh, working as a nurse on the left-hand side of the picture. Uh, together with Nikolai Kluev, a scion of old believer peasants, Yesenin read his poems in salons to the accompaniment of an accordion. Uh, for these performances, Yesenin and Kluev uh, wore costumes which had been made for them after sketches by the famous artist Viktor Vasnetsov. Morocco leather boots and blue silk shirts girded with a gold cord. Uh, Yesenin also spoke at evenings of the Society for the Revival of Artistic Rus at the Fyodorovsky Cathedral in Salsko Selo. And he read his poems to the Empress and to the Empress's sister, the Grand Duchess Elisabetta Fyodorovna. At a special concert attended by the Empress and her daughters, uh, Yesenin recited his poems Rus and in the Scarlet Afterglow. Uh, Vagrovom Zarevye Zakat Shipuch Ipienyen. The dawn is foaming and frothing in the scarlet afterglow. As he recalled later, the Empress told me my poems were beautiful, but sad. I replied, the same could be said about Russia as a whole. Uh, during his life, Yesenin published a number of short collections of verse. Many of these were first published in his first anthology entitled Radunitsa. Uh, the title refers to a particular Orthodox church holiday in commemoration of the dead. Uh, this volume was uh, published at the beginning of 1916 with the help of Anna Izviadnova. Um, his second collection uh, was published in 1918 under the title uh, Golubien, in which the author appeared as a pure peasant poet. In February 1917, the February Revolution ended 300 years of rule by the Romanov dynasty. The provisional government became the country's executive power. In August 1917, Yesenin married the beautiful Zinaida Reich. She was later to become an actress and the wife of the great theatre director, Sievolod Merholt. Um, Yesenin and Zin Zinaida had two children, a daughter, Tatiana, and a son, Constantine. The parents subsequently quarreled and lived separately for some time before their divorce in 1921. Constantine was born after the breakdown in their relationship. Uh, Tatiana became a writer and journalist, and Konstantin Yesenin 
would become a well-known uh, soccer statistician. From 1917 onwards, Yesenin's work underwent a distinct change. He began to write about social historical themes rather than portraying an idealized vision of Mother Russia and the Russian countryside. A new motif appeared in his verse, that of a challenge to the old patriarchal Russia, as for example, in the poem Inonia, which was published in 1918. Inonia, by the way, means Inaya Strana, another country. Yesenin supported uh, the February Revolution. If not for it, I might have withered away on useless religious symbolism, he wrote later. And at any rate, initially, he welcomed the rise of the Bolsheviks in the October Revolution too. As he recalled in his 1922 autobiography, in the revolution, I was all on the side of October, even if looking at everything in my own particular way from a peasant's point of view. Later on, however, he criticized a Bolshevik rule in such poems as stern October has deceived me. In a letter he wrote in August 1920 to his friend Yevgenia Lifshitz, he said, I feel very sad now for, for we are going through such a period in our history when human individuality is being destroyed and the approaching socialism is totally different from the one I was dreaming of. And as he maintained in his 1922 autobiography, I never joined the Russian Communist Party being further to, to the left than they were. Artistically, though, the revolutionary years were an exciting time for Yesenin. Among the important poems he wrote in 1917 and 1918 were Prishestvia, Advent, uh, Preobrazhenia, uh, Transfiguration, which gave the title to the 1918 collection, and as already mentioned, Inonia, which was published in 1918. In September 1918, uh, Yesenin became friendly with Anatoly Mariengov. Uh, together with him and other poets, Yesenin founded the Russian literary, uh, literary movement of Imaginism. In January 1919, Yesenin and other poets signed the Imaginists Manifesto. Uh, the following month, he, Mariengov, and Vadim Sheshinevich founded the Imaginists Publishing House. Uh, this next slide simply shows Vadim Sheshinevich. As the name suggests, the term Imaginism derives ultimately from the Latin word imago, meaning image. This avant-garde movement, which deliberately set out to shock, uh, was introduced by uh, Sheshinevich with the slogan, the image and the image alone. Some of the Imaginists called for, quotes, a breaking of grammar, and the creation of poems as strings of unrelated images. Unlike Mayakovsky and the Futurists, they adopted a strictly non-political stance. It's open to question whether Yesenin was ever fully committed to the proclaimed ideals of Imaginism. He was not by nature a person who could fit in with any constraints. And even though he enjoyed the soirees at the Imaginists Literary Cafe, the Pegasus Stall, Stoila Pegasa, it's quite likely that he associated with his fellow Imaginists as much out of his friendship, uh, particularly for Mariengov, as out of any sense of dedication uh, to the aims of the group. In 1922, uh, Yesenin described their group's general appeal in the following candid terms. Our fans are prostitutes and bandits. With them, we're good friends. The Bolsheviks, though, don't like us due to some kind of misunderstanding. Uh, following the death of Shershenevich and many disagreements among its members, the group had disintegrated uh, by 1924. Although the Imaginists didn't appeal to the Bolsheviks, they attracted some 
some support um, in left SR, that socialist revolutionary circles. This included the notorious Yakov Blumkin, who after the October Revolution in 1917, uh, became head of the Cheka's counter espionage department, working for Felix Zazinski. Uh, one of Blumkin's most notorious acts had been committed on behalf of the left SRs, who were opposed uh, to the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, um, as follows. On the 6th of July, 1918, carrying out the SR Executive Committee's orders, Blumkin had assassinated Wilhelm von Mirbach, the German ambassador to Russia, by shooting him at point blank range in the German embassy in Moscow. Uh, Blumkin, as well as being a secret policeman, was a lover of poetry and was often seen wandering about in Moscow with poets. He became very friendly uh, with Yesenin. Uh, the following episode illustrates the importance of that friendship. In October um, 1920, following an anonymous report or denunciation, Danos, the poet and two of his imaginist friends were arrested by the Cheka and interrogated at the Lubanka, Lubyanka prison. However, they were lucky. A week later, they were released at the specific direction of Jakob Blumkin, the lover of Yesenin's poetry. Um, in 1920, Yesenin met the poet and translator Nadiezda Volpina. Uh, they had an on-off relationship until their final break in summer 1923. I will come back uh, to Nadiezda Volpina fairly shortly. Meanwhile, in November 1920, at a literary evening devoted to, quote, the trial of the imaginists, uh, Yesenin met Galina Benislavskaya, his future secretary and close friend. It's perhaps worth adding that, quote, literary trials were very popular in Russian literary circles in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, Russian people of letters would, quote, try authors, dead or alive, books, classic or modern, and literary movements, past and present. However, as so often with his relationships with women, Yesenin's uh, relationship with Galina Benislavskaya was punctuated by continuous quarrels and reconciliations until the spring of 1925, when it ended in a final break. A year after the death of the poet, Benislavskaya shot herself at the sight of Yesenin's grave, literally on his grave. At the beginning of the 1920s, Yesenin wrote and published a long uh, poetic drama, Pugachev. Uh, the poet praised the spirit of the past and glorified uh, Pugachev and the rebellious peasants of the 18th century. Uh, Confessions of a Hooligan, Ispavied Khuligana, which he wrote um, in the same period in 1921, revealed a new facet of his personality. The poems in this collection were provocative and even vulgar in tone and gave vent to feelings of deep hurt and anguish. In the autumn of 1921, the famous American dancer Isadora Duncan arrived in Moscow. She had come to Russia, in her own words, to convert revolutionaries to the cult of Greek beauty. Yesenin met her at some event on the 3rd of October, 1921, and they immediately and very publicly fell in love. Isadora was almost 18 years older than Yesenin. Yesenin didn't speak any foreign languages, while Isadora knew a total of 12 Russian words. Nevertheless, they married 
on the ninth on, on the second of May, nineteen twenty two. Uh, this is a picture of the couple together, uh, looking rather glamorous. The newlyweds uh, then went abroad uh, for more than a year to Europe and then to the United States. At first, um, the impressions of Europe uh, led the poet to the idea that he had stopped loving impoverished Russia. But very soon, both Europe and industrial America began to strike him as kingdoms of Philistinism and boredom. Those thoughts found their expression in Yesenin's essay, Ayan Mirgorod, Zelyezny Mirgorod. Uh, just a note here, Mirgorod is a tiny provincial city in Ukraine uh, featuring in Gogol's eponymous collection. Uh, to Russians, it's a synonym for provincialism. In his 1922 autobiography, Yesenin wrote as follows. Russia's recent nomadic past does not appeal to me, and I am all for civilization. But I dislike America intensely. America is a stinking place where not just art is being murdered, but with it, all the loftiest aspirations of humankind. If it's America that we are looking up to as a model for our future, then I'd rather stay under our grayish skies. We don't have those skyscrapers that have so far managed to produce nothing but Rockefeller and McCormick. But here, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Pushkin and Lermontov were born. Um, Yesenin's public behavior, behavior during their journey was, to put it mildly, rather extravagant. The yellow press of Berlin, Paris, and New York reported extensively on Yesenin's excessive drinking bouts and rowdy behavior. Uh, the young Russian poet became known as the playboy of Europe and America. Uh, to some of us, Yesenin's behavior during this trip will call to mind that of the great Welsh poet, Dylan Thomas, uh, during his tours uh, to the USA in the early 1950s, which were also beset by heavy drinking and unruly behavior on the part of the poet. Upon returning to Moscow in 1923, uh, Yesenin divorced Isadora Duncan. As I mentioned earlier, um, Yesenin had a non-off relationship with the poet uh, Nadezhda Volpina, who had joined the Imaginist group of poets in 1920. After breaking with Isadora Duncan, uh, Yesenin renewed his relationship with Nadezhda. However, by this time, the poet had already met the actress, Augusta Miklashevskaya, fallen in love and started writing poems to her. Those poems were eventually to form the cycle, A Hooligan's Love, Yubov Hooligana, uh, published in 1923. In this collection, uh, Yesenin tried to distance himself from his earlier anarchism and praised the healing power of love. Uh, we're going to read the first poem from this cycle, When the Blue Fire Burst Into Flame. In the summer of 1923, Nadezhda Volpina told Yesenin that she was pregnant. Yesenin tried to persuade Nadezhda Volpina to have an abortion. Deeply wounded and angered, Nadezhda broke with Yesenin and left for Petrograd, where their son Alexander was born on the 12th of May, 1924. Alexander Yesenin Volpin grew up to become a poet, a renowned mathematician, and a prominent activist in the Soviet dissident movement of the 1960s. Uh, from 1972 until his death in uh, 2016, 
he lived in the United States. So in 1923, uh, Yesenin was back in Moscow, but he was not able to find a place for himself in the new Bolshevik Russia. The last years of his life were marked by tragic contradictions. According to the testimony of contemporaries, during hard drinking sessions, Yesenin was inclined uh, to criticize the Bolshevik regime in rather strident terms. This, of course, was a dangerous thing to do, as he would inevitably be the subject of denunciations to the secret police. But his status as a popular peasant poet served as a talisman for him. Usually, after spending some time in police cells, Yesenin would be released. In 1924 to 1925, he composed such masterpieces as his collection of poems, Moscow Taverns, Moskva Kabatskaya, and his long poem, The Dark Man, Shorni Chelyabiek. Most of the verses in his collection, Moscow Taverns, dealt with his bohemian life in bars, where he consorted with prostitutes, crooks, and other social outcasts who would be seeking consolation for their miserable lives through alcohol and daydreaming. The striking poem, The Dark Man, which was published posthumously, is considered Yesenin's most ruthlessly honest analysis of his own mental disturbances. Despite his difficult physical and moral condition and a fragile nervous system, which he had undermined through continuous heavy drinking, Yesenin continued to write. Some of his most celebrated and most powerful lyrics were written during this period. These include, the golden grove has lost its power of speaking, or Gavarila Rosha Zalataya, which we'll be reading this evening, and letter to mother, are you still alive, my old lady? Pismo Matri, Mayastaroshka. Uh, Yesenin would make regular visits every year to Konstantinova uh, to see his mother. And the poem, Letter to Mother, Are You Still Alive, My Old Lady, expresses the deep love Yesenin continued to feel for his mother throughout his life. This touching photograph shows mother and son together. <clears throat> I would also like to mention the, color, uh, the colorful and beautiful cycle, Persian Motifs. Persitsky Motivi. We're going to read uh, two poems from this cycle. Uh, today I went to ask the money changer, Yas Brasil Sibonia Umenyali, and Shahane, you are my Shahane. Shahane Timaya Shahane. Uh, Yesenin wrote Shahane, you are my Shahane, on the 20th of December 1924, when he was living in Batum in Georgia. Uh, the name of Shahane appears to have been inspired by and to be in honor of the young Armenian woman he met in Batum who had come there from uh, Tiflis to work as a Russian teacher. Shahane Tetarian. In March 1925, uh, Yesenin met Sofia Talstaya. Uh, the granddaughter of Leo Tolstoy. Uh, when he decided to marry her and told Galina Benislavskaya of his intention to do so, the latter understandably objected in the strongest possible terms. However, Yesenin was unmoved. Benislavskaya immediately broke off all personal and business connections with him. Uh, Sergei and Sofia were married on the 18th of September 1925. Uh, Sofia tried to get Yesenin help with his depression, uh, but he suffered a mental breakdown and was hospitalized in a psychiatric clinic uh, for a month. On the 21st of December, uh, Yesenin left the clinic, and on the 23rd of December, he took out his belongings from Sofia Tolstaya's house in Moscow, where they had been living together, and left abruptly for what by now I was known as Leningrad. 
On the 28th of December, 1925, Yesenin was found dead at the Hotel Angleterre in Leningrad by his friend, Georgi Ustinov and Ustinov's wife, Elizaveta. Uh, Yesenin's civil funeral took place at the Poets' Union in Leningrad. His body was subsequently transported by train uh, to Moscow uh, for a state funeral. Uh, he was buried on the 31st of December, 1925, in Moscow. It was the first state funeral for a man of letters in the history of Russia, now the Soviet Union. Around 200,000 people came to say farewell to their poet. The coffin uh, with Yesenin's remains was taken to Pushkin Square, placed in front of the Pushkin Monument, and allowed to remain there for some time with silence strictly observed by all in the vicinity. Uh, Yesenin was buried at the Vagankova uh, Cemetery in Moscow. Um, his grave was eventually marked by a white marble sculpture of the poet, which you can see. Um, it was installed there only in 2015. And this slide shows the monument uh, to Yesenin in Konstantinova. Um, historians still argue about the death of Sergei Yesen. According to the official version, uh, the poet who had been drinking heavily for a long time and who was notorious for his wild lifestyle, hanged himself from a heating pipe in his room at the Hotel Angleterre on the 28th of December. It was said that on the previous day, instead of a suicide note, he had uh, given his farewell poem, Farewell, my dear friend, farewell, written in his own blood to the poet Wolf Ehrlich. However, many people don't accept the official version. It's said that Sergei Yesenin could not have hanged himself as he had no reason for doing this. Contemporaries have commented that on the eve of his death, he was cheerful and gave no hint of any emotional anxieties and moreover, that he was enthusiastically and impatiently awaiting publication of three volumes of his complete poetic works. Some aspects of the official version simply don't stack up. After a great uh, number of very thorough investigations, substantial evidence has been gathered suggesting that Yesenin was murdered by the secret police. For example, the central heating pipe from which the body was hanging was next to the ceiling at a height of 3.8 meters. It is not possible to explain how Yesenin on his own would have been able to reach such a height. However, uh, neither the official version nor this alternative version uh, can be uh, proved beyond doubt. And to this day, it's not been possible to establish conclusively how Yesenin really died. It is though perhaps not without significance that government and NKVD archives dealing with uh, Yesenin's death are still closed. The poet Vladimir, Vladimir Mayakovsky was enraged when he heard uh, that Yesenin had committed suicide and dedicated a poem to him with the title Sergeyu Yeseninu, to Sergei Yesenin. Mayakovsky um, was in fact tasked by the authorities in his poem to dissuade Yesenin's fans uh, from copycat suicides, and he willingly tried to do this. Uh, thus, in his poem, the resigned ending of Yesenin's farewell to life is countered by these verses. In this life, it is not hard to die. To make life is much more difficult. Veto jizni pameriet nietrudna, zdila jizn znachitona trudnie.
The communist authorities uh, in the Soviet Union viewed a Yesenin's poetry with suspicion because of its individualism and so-called hooliganism. And they were afraid that his works would undermine the doctrines of socialist realism. Uh, in consequence, they banned his works and prosecuted people for reading and reciting his poetry. Yesenin's works um, were banned until Stalin's death in 1953. Uh, since then, Yesenin's poetic works have been published and republished countless numbers of times. In conclusion, uh, Yesenin's work combined lyrical motifs and love for the rural environment with tragic notes based on the poet's personal experiences. At first, idealistic hopes for socialist construction and then disappointment with the socialist dream and deep depression. Yesenin's works have inspired a huge response in music, cinema, theater, painting and sculpture. Many of his uh, poems were set to music and became truly popular. They have in effect become folk songs. We're now going to read a total of 11 of Yesenin's poems in David and Ludmilla Matthews' English translations and in the Russian original. But first, we're going to have a musical interlude. Uh, Rafi is going to play us a video recording in which um, one of the poems will be sung in Russian by Lila Mashtal to her own guitar accompaniment and uh, to violin accompaniment by Julian Milone. Uh, this poem is The Golden Grove Has Lost Its Power of Speaking. Ot Gavarila Rosha Zalataya. Oh, 
Thank you, Leela and Julian. That was wonderful. Uh, we're now going to read the, the poems. We'll read the English uh, first. Uh, Lucy, Daniels and I will, will share the reading between us. When the blue fire burst into flame, I forgot native distances calling. For the first time, I sang of my love. For the first time, I gave up my brawling. I resembled a garden grown wild and had passion for women and drinking. But then dancing and wine lost their charm and just wasting my life without thinking. I could only have wished to see you and your eyes like the whirlpool so golden, knowing you, never fond of the past, to another could not be beholden. Lightest form with the gentlest gait, if you knew in your heart so dismissive how a hooligan changes his ways, how in love he can be so submissive. Noisy taverns I would have renounced, Anna stopped writing my verse and declaiming. For one touch of your soft, gentle hand and your hair with its autumnal flaming. I would follow you all of my life, not to heed near or far distant calling. For the first time, I sang of my love. For the first time, I gave up my brawling. Заметался пожар голубой, позабылись родимые дали. В первый раз я запел про любовь, в первый раз отрекаюсь скандалить. Был я весь, как запущенный сад, был на женщин и зелье падки. Разонравилось петь и плясать И терять свою жизнь без оглядки. Мне бы только смотреть на тебя, Видеть глаз златокарий омут, И чтоб прошлое не любя, Ты уйти не смогла к другому. Поступ нежная, Легкий стан, если б знала ты сердцем упорным, как умеет любить хулиган, как умеет он быть покорным, я б навеки забыл кабаки и стихи бы писать забросил, только тонкой касаться руки и волос твоих светом восень. Я б навеки пошел за тобой, хоть в свои, хоть в чужие дали. В первый раз я запел про любовь, в первый раз отрекаюсь скандали. With no regret, no call, no tearful parting, like smoke from the white apple tree unsung, yes, all will pass. And I in gold enveloped shall fade away. No more shall I be young. No longer will you flutter as you used to, my heart touched by the chill of some cold hand. The cotton of the birch trees will not tempt me to roam barefoot about their magic land. Ah, oh, restless spirit, rarely and more rarely your flame will to the lips of passion rise. The freshness I once had has now departed, the flood of the feelings, riot of the eyes. At last, in my desires, I have grown meaner. My life 
or is it just the dream you bring as if I galloped on a rosy stallion to meet the early echoing hour of spring. We all live in this world of putrefaction and bronze drips from the maple with a sigh. Be blessed forever with this benediction. All you who came to flower and to die. Не жалею, не зову, не плачу. Все пройдет, как с белых яблонь дым. Увидание золотом охваченный, я не буду больше молодым. Ты теперь не так уж будешь биться, сердце тронутая холодком, и страна березового ситца не заманит шляться босиком. Дух бродяжий, ты все реже, реже расшевеливаешь пламень уст. О, моя утраченная свежесть, буйство глаз, и половодье чувств. Я теперь скупее стал в желаниях. Жизнь моя, Иль ты приснилась мне, Словно я весенней гулкой ранью Проскакал на розовом коне. Все мы, все мы в этом мире тленны. Тихо льется с кленов листьев медь. Будь же ты вовек благословенна, Что пришло процвесть и умереть. My maple tree, so bare now. My maple frozen, groaning. Why do you stand there bowing beneath the snowstorm's moaning? Did you see something stirring? Did you hear someone talking? It seems that you've been roaming the village while out walking. And like a drunken watchman upon the road, you stumbled. Your leg was frozen solid in the snowdrift where you tumbled. Alas, today I totter. Like you, I feel unstable. I doubt that I shall make it from the friendly drinking table. And there I met a willow. I heard a pine tree calling. I sang them songs of summer as snowflakes went on falling. I felt just like the maple, the one that I discovered. And yet I was not bare then, but green and thickly covered. At once I lost my shyness and drunk, behaving badly, I hugged the birch tree like someone else's woman, madly. Клен ты мой опавший, клен заледенелый, Что стоишь, нагнувшись под метелью белой, Или что увидел, или что услышал, Или за деревню погулять ты вышел. И как пьяный сторож, Выйдя на дорогу, Утонул в сугробе, Приморозил ногу. Ах, 
и сам я нынче, что это стал нестойкий, не дойду до дому с дружеской попойки. Там вон встретил вербу, там сосну приметил, распевал им песни под метель. Олете сам себе казался я таким же кленом, только не опавшим, а вовсю зеленым, и утратив скромность, одуревший в доску, как жену чужую обнимал берез. On a dark blue night in moonlight rare, once I was handsome, young and fair. Uncontrollably, quite uniquely, everything fled so far, so quickly. The heart grew cool and dim the eyes. Dark blue happiness, moonlit skies, Вечером синим, вечером лунным Был я когда-то красивым и юным. Неудержимо, неповторимо Все пролетело далече, мимо. Сердце остыло, и выцвели очи. Синие счастья, лунные ночи. Don't smile and pull such faces. Don't wring your hand. It's true. You see, I love another. Another, but not you. I think you know the answer. You know it well and true. I never tried to see you. I never came to you. My heart felt no affection. I came to you by chance. But as I passed your window, I thought I'd steal a glance. Не криви улыб. Руки теребя. Я люблю другую, только не тебя. Ты сама ведь знаешь, знаешь хорошо. Не тебя я вижу, не к тебе пришел. Проходил я мимо, сердцу все равно. Просто захотелось заглянуть в окно. I remember, my love, I remember the radiant glow of your hair. It was hard and it gave me no pleasure to go off and abandon you there. I remember the nights of the autumn, the rustling birch in the shade, Though the days at that time were much shorter, the moonlight took longer to fade. I remember you said to me softly, they will vanish these years of light blue and you will forget me, my darling. Another will come to love you. But today, the blossoming linden made me think of those days without care, how tenderly then I strewed flowers on your locks and the curls of your hair. And my heart, without losing its ardor, sadly loving somebody new, like recalling a favorite story, my heart remembers you. Я помню, 
любимая, помню сияние твоих волос. Не радостно и нелегко мне оставить тебя привелось. Я помню осенние ночи, березовый шорох теней. Хоть дни тогда были короче, луна нам светила длиннее. Я помню, ты мне говорила, пройдут голубые года, и ты позабудешь, мой милый, с другою меня навсегда. Сегодня цветущая липа напомнила чувством опять, как нежно тогда я сыпал цветы на кудрявую прядь. И сердце остыть не готовясь и грустно другую любя. Как будто любимую повесть с другой вспоминает тебя. The snowstorm weeps like a gypsy violin. My sweetest girl, your smile a wicked grin. But do I fear your glances of dark blue? I need so much, but not so much from you. We're far apart. You're not like me at all. You are so young, and I've been through it all. But youth is happy. All that's left to me are thoughts of snowy nights in misery. I'm not caressed. The storm's my violin. Your smile pounds at my heart. Your wicked grin. Плачет метель, как цыганская скрипка. Милая девушка, злая улыбка. Я не робею от синего взгляда. Много мне нужно и много не надо. Как мы далеки и как не схожи. Ты молодая, а я все прожил. Юношам счастье, а мне лишь Память снежную ночью в лихую замять. Я не заласкан, буря мне скрипка. Сердце метелит твоя улыбка. The Golden Grove has lost its power of speaking. The story of its birch tree's tongue is done. And when the cranes fly sadly ever onwards, no longer do they care for anyone. Who should we grieve for? Everyone's a drifter. They come then leave their homes and pass beyond the hemp field dreams of all who once departed. The moon is wide above the dark blue pond. Upon the naked plain, I stood with no one, and by the wind, the cranes are driven on. About my happy youth, my thoughts come rushing, but I have no regrets for what has gone. I do not mind the years that I have wasted. I do not mind the lilac flowering soul The rowan's fire burns red about the garden, but gives no warmth to anyone at all. The rowan clusters 
will not yield to burning, nor will the grass fade in the yellow sun. And as the tree discards its leaves so gently, so shall I shed my sad words one by one. If time goes by and with the wind comes sweeping and rakes them into one unwanted pile, just say the golden grove is lost in silence and can no longer with its song beguile. Отговорила роща золотая Березовым веселым языком И журавли, печально пролетая Уж не жалеют больше ни о ком Кого жалеть? Ведь каждый в мире странник Пройдет, зайдет и вновь оставит дом. А всех ушедших грезит конопляник С широким месяцем над голубым рудом. Стою один среди долины голой, А журавлей относит ветер вдаль. Я полон дум о юности веселой, Но ничего в прошедшем мне не жаль. Не жаль мне лет, растраченных напрасно, Не жаль души сиреневую цвет, в саду горит костер рябины красной, Но никого не может он согреть. Не отгорят рябиновые кисти, От желтизны не пропадет трава, Как дерево роняет Тихо листья, так я роняю грустные слова. И если время, ветром разметая, Сгребет их все в один ненужный ком, Скажите так что роща золотая отговорила милым языком. Today I went to ask the money changer who gives a ruble for a half to man. What words in Persian for my lovely Lala? express I love you. Tell me if you can. Today I went to ask the money changer, more softly than the breeze that blows on van, what tender words to use for lovely Lala when asking for a kiss that might be won. Again I went and asked the money changer, with shyness hidden deeper in my heart, how I might make it clear to lovely Lala that she is mine and we shall never part. The money changer gave me one short answer. By words alone, love cannot be expressed, but love is shown in eyes that burn like sapphires and stealthy sighs that well up in the breast. In words, the sweetest kiss has no expression, like some inscription on a tomb unfelt. For kisses must be blown like scarlet roses, and on the lips their tender petals melt. In love, 
no guarantee comes for the asking. For here, both grief and happiness reside. And you are mine, the hands can only utter, when they have cast the dusky veil aside. Я спросил сегодня у меня ли, что дает за пол тумана по рублю. Как сказать мне для прекрасной лалы по персидски нежной люблю? Я спросил сегодня у меня ли, тише ветра, легче ванских струй. Как назвать мне для прекрасной лалы слово ласковое поцелуй? И еще спросил я у меня ли в сердце робость глубже притая? Как сказать мне для прекрасной лалы? Как сказать ей? что она моя. И ответил мне меняла кратко. О любви в словах не говорят, о любви вздыхают лишь украдкой. Да глаза, как яхонты горят, Поцелуй названия не имеет, Поцелуй не надпись на гроба. Красной розой поцелуи веют, Лепестками тая на губах. От любви не требуют поруки, с ней узнают радость и беду. Ты моя, сказать лишь могут руки, Что срывали черную чадру. Шахане, you are my Шахане. Since I come from the north, let me say, how the billowing rye in the fields to the moonlight submissively yields. Shahane, you are my Shahane. Ah, the moon in the north is so fair and a hundred times bigger than here. Your Shiraz may be fine in your eyes, but Riazan has its wide open skies. Ah, the moon in the north is so fair. Let me talk of the fields with a sigh, how my locks were the gift of the rye. Twine them round through your fingers again. Your caressing will give me no pain. Let me talk of the fields with a sigh. Through the billowing rye in the moon, take a guess from my curls, and quite soon you will laugh. But my dear, when we part, do not wake longing thoughts in my heart through the billowing rye in the moon. Shahane, you are my Shahane. But there in the north far away is a girl who is so much like you. And perhaps she remembers me too. Shahane, you are my Shahane. Шагане, ты моя, шагане. Потому что я с севера, что ли, Я готов рассказать тебе поле Про волнистую рожь при луне. Шагане, ты моя, шагане. Потому что я с севера, что ли, Что луна там... Огромней в сто раз, Как бы ни был красивший раз, 
Он не лучше рязанских раздолей, Потому что я с севера, что ли. Я готов рассказать тебе поле. Эти волосы взял я у ржи. Если хочешь, на палец свежи. Я нисколько не чувствую боли. Я готов рассказать тебе поле. Про волнистую рожь при луне По кудрям ты моим догадайся. Дорогая, шути, улыбайся, Не буди только память во мне Про волнистую рожь при луне. Шагане ты моя, шагане, там, на севере, девушка тоже. На тебя она страшно похожа. Может, думает обо мне. Шагане ты моя, шагане. Farewell, my dear friend, farewell. In my heart forever you'll stay. May our fated parting foretell that we will meet again someday. Let no words nor handshakes ensue, no saddened brows in remorse. In this life, dying, is nothing new, and living's no newer, of course. До свидания, друг мой, до свидания. Милый мой, ты у меня в груди. Предназначенное расставание Обещает встречу впереди. До свидания, друг мой, Без руки и слова. Не печалься и не хмурь бровей. В этой жизни умирать не ново, Но и жить. Конечно, не новей. Uh, that is the end of our performance, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're very happy to um, to answer any questions or to discuss any points uh, you'd like to raise. But I, I hope you've enjoyed it. Yes, very much. Um... Just, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody, um, all the uh, readers and reciters. It was absolutely uh, magnificent. I'm um, slightly in uh, a daze almost. The poetry kind of lulls you into a, a sense of a state of, of uh, calm and pensiveness. It, um, it's very overwhelming. And so I haven't got anything really clever to ask. Um, but um, do please put your questions in the uh, chat if you have any. Um, and I'll maybe just um, say something about how, or ask something about how um, um, this thing fits into the kind of idea of the um, slightly uh, debauched poet. Um, in, in sort of, I mean, maybe calling Pushkin debauched as a uh, strong. He certainly is within the same tradition as, as uh, Pushkin and Lermontov, I think. Um, a very messy personal life and uh, um, beautiful, sort of very incisive and um, humanistic poems that came out of it. And um, 
uh, and a, quite a young ending as well. Um, so, the, There's so many uh, Russian yeah. plants. Tragically, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, I mean, he, he obviously is in the, he was imbued or with, with the whole tradition, the Pushkinian tradition. And um, I, I would say he's an outstanding lyric poet. Um, I think almost to regard him as a peasant poet is, it doesn't do justice to him. Um, it, it's the honesty and the directness and the, the immediacy of the images. And um, I find that's why poetry for me is such a wonderful medium, the, the immediate um, communication of, of emotion. And the private life is, of course, um, uh, terrible. Um, but um, <laughs> that's, he didn't he didn't shy away from talking about it. The, um, there are some very dark passages in some of his his poems. I mean, the, the dark man, Johnny Chelyabinsk, which we didn't read. Um, but but he was ruthless, as I said, he ruthless, was ruthlessly honest in dissecting his own failings and uh, and problems. I think, um, I mean, David and Ludmilla, why we um, thought it right to do this, because they were particular, particularly keen on um, on Yesenin. And um, I, I feel perhaps he's not as well known as he might be, um, and perhaps not as well appreciated as he might be in, um, in this country. Um, Russians, of course, know him from their school days. Um, and, and no whole passages off by heart as they do with Pushkin and other poets. Mm, yeah, I think he's probably one of the most famous Russian poets that is very little known in Britain. Yes. Would uh, you? In fact, yes, there aren't many. There aren't many um, monographs or um, books that, that I found. In fact, one of the um, the most interesting. I mentioned Roger Pulvers, and I can recommend his book. Holy Yesenin. It's a, a book of his translations, which are very good. Um, but some commentary on on Yesenin's life and his different um, his relationships with different women. And uh, well, I mentioned Roger Pulvers is Australian. He was originally uh, born in the United States and is um, has written a lot on cross cultural issues. He's very keen on Japanese and um, spends his time between Sydney and Tokyo. But he spent, uh, he studied at Harvard uh, Russian language and literature and has always had a, a deep love for um, Russian poetry. So that I found it very refreshing reading his, um, his translations. Um, I hadn't come across him before. Would you uh, say a little about uh, David and Ludmilla actually? Just, uh, yeah, what? yes, of course, with, with uh, the, the utmost um, pleasure. Um, <sighs> Um, I met David and Ludmilla through uh, the Great Britain Russia Society and the Pushkin Club, where they were both members. Um, uh, Ludmilla uh, was from Kiev, and, and David met her when he was visiting Kiev. Um, they fell in love, and they wanted to get married, and they had enormous problems. Um, getting the necessary permit for Ludmilla to come over. Uh, but they had a very happy uh, married life. Um, they both were passionate about Russian literature. Uh, David, by the way, um, was in fact the, the most brilliant linguist I have ever encountered in my whole life. Um, he was a, a senior lecturer at SOAS, the School of, African, of Oriental and African Studies, um, his speciality was Urdu, but he knew Hindi and various other South Asian languages, but also was fluent, and I'm not joking, I mean fluent in uh, Farsi, Turkish and Arabic, and spoke um, beautiful Russian, impeccable Russian. And um, I don't know how he had this gift. He, he went on a visit to Japan, and when he came back, um, I, I don't think you'd mind me telling this anecdote. He, I said, I suppose you now speak fluent Japanese, David. I said with usual English irony. He then proceeded to talk to me in what I assume was sort of sophisticated Japanese. I said, look, I don't understand a word of what you said. Um, but he, his ear 
w w he had a most musical ear. And I remember him reading that the Shahane, um, his own translation, so wonderfully. Um, and he, you could see he identified very much with, with the sentiment in those poems. Um, they were really a, a wonderful couple. And um, it's, it's very sad they're no longer with us. Um, um, Ludmilla, by the way, she taught at CIS. She, she took, lectured in, in Russian at CIS. And um, they were both very, very knowledgeable about many aspects of, um, of Russian literature and poetry. And not just Yesenin, but um, Pushkin and Lermontov and, and others. Um, I don't know if, um, Allo, you would like to add anything uh, to that? I think it was you who first mentioned to me when you met um, David and Ludmilla. Well, I met Ludmilla actually at, <laughs> at the university <laughs> when I was reading there <laughs> for students. So she, she was teaching there. I see. And then she discovered that we live very close to each other. So we just became friends and neighbors. Then I met David and they were the most hospitable couple I had ever encountered. <laughs> but we better talk about Yesenin, I think. We have two questions, at least. I can see a couple of questions, yeah. Um, so one, one says, uh, or asks, why are the archives surrounding his death still closed? Well, uh, well, I don't know. Um, you should ask the authorities. <laughs> yes, uh, ask FSB, yes. <laughs> but I think it is actually quite, um, I don't know, it, it does to an extent um, encourage the, the foul play. Um, yes, well, it does. Yeah. And I, I think, I, I must admit, with it's awful with these theories because one honestly doesn't know. And one should say, um, in November 1925, um, Yesenin had been in a psychiatric clinic for a month. Um, that's where he wrote the, the poem about the maple tree. So he, he had been drinking alcohol in such vast quantities that clearly that had had an effect on his, both his uh, uh, physical and mental state. Uh, so he may have been okay um, on some occasions, but then not so well on other occasions. So one honestly doesn't know. Um, the trouble is when the authorities then don't disclose the archives, then suspicions, it feeds suspicions. Um, I don't think one can take it any further than, um, th than I've said. There are, there are inconsistencies or uh, certain oddities about the official version of events. And his friends, um, his friends were all deeply suspicious about what happened. Um, I see that, um, Taisia, you had a question. Yeah, uh, let me see if you can. If you, if you prefer to. Please, uh, yes, can I say that? Because uh, uh, typing is a little bit difficult, you know, it's very small letters. Uh, yes, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you very much, uh, David and Allah and uh, uh, Julian and Lilia and, uh, um, and Lucy. Yes, uh, it was great. Uh, really, really good. Very inspiring. I wanted to ask your opinion, um, David and Alan, maybe others as well. Um, so I, I, uh, <clears throat> I was, I was thinking. I often think, how, how come Yesenin became such a great, great poet? I mean, he, he comes uh, from uh, like peasant background, yes. So he was not uh, so well educated. So um, I know that the uh, the nature is amazing, really inspiring in that part of Russia. I have been in Ryazan region and in Constantino. It's just beautiful nature. But still, uh, how how did he manage to become such a great poet? Uh, really, um, what do you think? Who were his teachers, and who inspired him? Was it was it his uh, grandmother? Maybe she maybe she sang with him songs, or uh, they read uh, a lot. So, what do you think? What inspired him, and what uh, uh, nurtured his talent? Uh? Well, yeah, well, yeah. Oh, Ella, you reply, yeah. No, uh, I I think that the just solution, no, the answer to that question is in his uh, childhood experience, because he was uh, raised yes. by his um, grandparents, 
uh, who were okay. old believers, and it means that mm -hmm. they, uh, well, with, with, everybody says that the peasants were uh, uh, illiterate, but his uh, grandfather knew, I understand the Bible, mm -hmm. the, uh, and not in Russian, but in church Slavonic. So mm -hmm. that's why Yesenian's language is just not so-called intelligence new speak or mm -hmm. something like that. His uh, vocabulary is uh, so rich and so unusual. You can't yes, exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, has the same, but not uh, with such uh, immediate accessibility. That was mm -hmm. it, it was his uh, nature, just immediate uh, accessibility. But but the vocabulary, I think she just took it from uh, his childhood, from uh, his neighbors, from the church, from his uh, grandfather, from the church books. No, just, just remember mm -hmm. the um, titles of his books: Sarakaust, uh, mm -hmm. Prishestvie, uh, Preobrazhenie. That's uh, uh, he. He says that please to look as, as if it is was some um, like Greek my, my fall, uh, mythology, like other mm -hmm. poets are uh, referring to the uh, Achilles. How to shall I say it in English? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to the Trojan oh, War and so on. So he referred to the um, uh, Gospels. I think Roger um, might yes. also want to answer those as well. Uh, if you like to unmute yourself. Um, Hi there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for another wonderful evening. And it's just wonderful to sit here and listen to those good translations and the wonderful Russian. I would just like to attest to the fact that the Russians, the Russians love for Yesenin. I always remember at Moscow University, a Russian suddenly turning to me and quoting from Soraka Ust, that wonderful poem and the passage in which there's a train going along yes. and a horse gall galloping along the side, trying to keep up. And I always remember that. And I read and I, from then on, I was fascinated by Yesenian and, and read him a lot. Just one question, is the, the you read 11 poems, did you, tonight? Yes. And to, um, is there a list of the poems that you read? Yes, I, I'm very happy to, um, to send that. By the way, the, the, the choice of poems um, made itself for us because th those poems uh, were read um, during the, the presentation that David and Ludmilla uh, did to the Pushkin Club in 2015. Right. So, in fact, they've not been published. I, I think they are terrific translations. They really are. Oh, I thought they had been published. Uh, is it really? I don't think so. No, I, uh, David had given me a hard copy. Okay. A hard copy of the of his translations. Hmm. And um, when I heard, when I recently heard uh, that he had passed away, um, we thought it would be appropriate to um, to do this. As, as, a, as a kind of paying tribute to them. Um, yeah, brilliant, thank you. Not at all, but I'm very happy to, um, shall I send those to you, Rafi? The, um... Um, I've, I've got, I've, you've already sent them to me. Oh, of course I have, yes. Um, so I'll, I can send them around. Um, yes. You can send out the recording of this to everybody. Um, but I would, yeah, I, I'm surprised that they haven't been translated, myself, uh, haven't been published myself actually, because they're, you mentioned that he had a very musical ear and, and the, um, they do have a very kind of musical, they're almost like songs, and I suppose. Oh yes, they do. And he, honestly, I'm not just saying this out of false modesty, but David's own reading um, of those poems in English was uh, was second to none. Mm. And by the way, he he recited or read beautifully in Russian as well, um, whichever language he was speaking in. No, I think it would be marvelous um, to do it. I should say that the last poem, by the way, is not his. It's it's an anonymous uh, translator. For some reason, I didn't have the the version of Dosvidanya, Moidrug Dosvidanya, but but all the others are by 
um, by, da by David. With, with Ludmilla, it's, I would call them joint translations. They work Can very I, sorry. closely together. Sorry, Can Lucia. I add about the last one that um, I have an infuriating habit of retranslating things that I think could be improved upon. And so because everything else was translated by David and Ludmilla, I didn't touch those because this is all about them. But I had a really good go at trying to retranslate the last one. But actually, I think they've the anonymous has done it as well as you possibly could. It's really good. It's really yeah. in the spirit of the original, isn't it? And I think it flows in English too. Mm. Thank you. I'll read out another question or comment that we've got here uh, from Natasha. I've been in Constantina and we were allowed to enter the house. I remember his mother's shushun hanging by the door in the porch. It was an unforgettable two-day cruise on our car. Thank you, Alla, Lucy and David for this lovely evening. And thank you also to Lilia and Julian. Um, and actually, that um, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate the thanks to Lilia and Julian as well, because um, it's it's very, very a, a testament to how, how lyrical Yesenian's work is, that it works. Basically, I mean, reading them out, you, you do feel almost like you're reading song lyrics. They're very, the, the rhyme scheme and the meters are all very much, would lend themselves very well to songs. And I think it makes sense as to why he became uh, um, so popular in the Soviet Union as um, or his, his works were put to music so often. Um, I, I appreciate that it is actually quite late. Um, so if there are any questions, any other questions, please uh, let them in as soon as you can. Well, that's it, I think. Mm -hmm. just, just to say one thing, because when Ala read at the end, she read the poem that we played uh, and Leela sang, and Rafi's right, you could really hear the, um, you could almost hear the, the sort of the the in, yeah. the, in the reciting as, you, as we could in the song which we sang. It's, um, it's really interesting. Mm. Um, Sorry, can I just uh, um, Julian and Leela, was that 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 was your own um, music? Was it? It was your own? No, 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 no. No, no. no. okay. I it didn't was, know. It was written. The, the tune was by Pon Grigory Panamarenko. Ah, okay. okay. I wrote the violin part, and Leela wrote the accompaniment. So, in effect, it was a three-way split. Okay, that is fabulous. It was, yeah. Fabulous. Yeah, absolutely fabulous, yeah. <laughs> um, well, um, it's been a really lovely evening. I, I'm, um, I'm, I, I, I can't, I don't really have anything to say. I think it was so, so, so for itself so well, honestly. Um, and I can't, I can't add anything uh, of, of any interest. So I'll just thank everybody, all the performers, uh, David, Lucy, Alla, and Julian and Lilia, um, again, Thank you for, for bringing this and uh, preparing it and um, reading it out so, so brilliantly. And thank you to our audience, um, as, as stalwart as ever, so, um, and for your questions, of course. Um, and uh, I hope to see you very soon. Um, do, we, do we have any indication of what the Pushkin Club is going to come up with next? Well, we have the idea of having an evening on Mandelstrom. Mm. Um, it's poetry. Um, well, yeah. you, actually, you know what? Are there any more of these Yesenian translations? Um, you said there was a whole, whole lot. Well, um, well, no, there aren't many. Jesse Davis uh, is another um, uh, translator. She's translated quite a few, and uh, Roger Pulvers, but I haven't come across many others. Mm -hmm. Um, in Robert Chandler's book, 20th Century Russian Poetry, um, there's a very good chapter on Yesenin, and there are some very nice translations by Boris Draluk. But um, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of there being a, a sort of major set of translations. So it's perhaps something that's, <laughs> that's there crying out to be done. It, it definitely feels like it. I, I'm... I'm... This is really, I've not really ever read them before. I've heard, I've heard a lot of people tell me to, and I've just never even got around to it, and I'm just uh, cursing the fact that I didn't do it sooner. <laughs> well, same here, yeah. Well, well anyway, um, I think that about wraps it up. So I'll, um, I'll say thanks once more, and uh, 
hopefully see you again soon. Absolutely. And thank you, Rafi, for hosting it so, so yes, smoothly. Thank as you always. for organizing this, Rafi. Uh, not at all. I, I just, um, I just to do the behind the scenes stuff. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good night, one and all. Good night. Good, night. Good, Good to see you all. Good night. Thanks, Julian. Lila. Great to see you, Adrian.